things there. The, the most difficult session of the day is the last session because I have to compete with your sense of restlessness and with, in school terms, chutti ki ghanti. And I do understand the heavy burden uh, Madhukar has placed on me. Uh, very cognizant of that. But I have enjoyed the day thoroughly, uh, listening to the likes of Malti Madam, listening to the likes of Farida Madam, uh, listening to Professor Homiyar, uh, uh, and many other people as well. Uh, let me start, and I will be sticking to time. Um, let me start the conversation by a combination of three or four more questions, uh, four questions that we have discussed at length already. But I will try and use the systemic lens, and I will go back to the, Kushku, to the point Kushu made earlier of if empathy can be scaled, uh, and I will try and unpack how uh, uh, empathy at scale, at systemic, institutional, and government level may perhaps uh, look like. So let me start by asking what excludes? Unless we get clarity of what excludes or what includes, uh, and how do we read signals of the process of exclusion, or how do we read signals of process of inclusion? Uh, unless we use a combination of these questions, uh, we will perhaps deprive ourselves of what empathy at scale looks like. So let me start by sharing a few stories. Uh, and these are all stories from Delhi government schools. So let me introduce Divya to you. Divya is seven year old. She was absent from our Delhi government school for 12 consecutive days. And because she was absent for 12 consecutive days, and the reason that we know is uh, uh, all teachers in Delhi government schools have a tab. All attendance in Delhi government schools happens on a tab every morning through a mobile app. So every data is accessible to us in real time. So by 9 a.m. I already know which class, which grade, which section, which school, which district, which zone is present, absent, and whatever else. So, so Divya was absent, seven-year-old girl, 12 consecutive days. So we got worried. Uh, uh, and we reached out to Divya's family to find out what, what's happening. And we realized that the reason is medical. Divya has a breast cyst. And for a, a family from different forms of disadvantaged background, uh, navigating a large government hospital administration could be intimidating. The family needed help. Long story, we, we provided help uh, to Divya. Divya is perfectly all right. She underwent surgery in the, in the last week of August. Started attending school two days a week in September, three days October, and recorded 100% tendons in February. Let me now introduce to you Priya. Priya is a 17-year-old girl. She uh, was also absent for 10 consecutive days. And when she was absent for 10 consecutive days, we again got worried and we started asking questions of what might be excluding her, uh, that she's absent from uh, education institution for 10 consecutive days. So we reached out. And the answer was that the parents have decided to marry her. And because parents have decided to they have fixed a date for marriage already, almost two months down the line. Uh, and they saw a little value in continuing to send um, Priya to school. This, and the reason I am telling this story, uh, uh, is because what excludes is our certain cultural practice of how we view our daughters. But this is a signal that we can read of the exclusion, which is absence, her absence from the school, her consistent absence from the school. Longer story cut short, we reached out, we involved the child marriage prohibition officer, we counseled, cajoled, coerced parents, uh, made them see value in uh, not letting uh, Priya uh, get married at, early, at such an early age. Uh, this was a story of last week of July. Uh, Priya appeared for class 10th board last year and finished exams and now is waiting results. And she is still unmarried. Mm -hmm. Let me introduce to you Sanjay. And let me once again focus on uh, the early sign of exclusion. This time a different cause. And this time this 13 year old boy was absent for 9 consecutive days and again we got worried as we started asking why Sanjay 
absent. And we found that actually when we reached out to the family, the family told us, no, Sanjay has been attending school every day. And the problem was Sanjay was not. Uh, he was bunking the school every day uh, for nine consecutive days. And perhaps earlier as well. So we got down to talking to Sanjay and we uh, realized a bunch of things that, burned, that he was going through. Uh, both at home uh, and outside, which we also learned in the process that he has now started consuming different forms of substance. In general, adolescent boys in particular, when they consistently bunk schools, there's a great degree of overlap in them uh, moving towards consumption of substance, which is then strongly correlated with children who come in conflict with law. These are stages, typically. Not a hundred percent congruence, but there's a de great degree of overlap between the three stages. So that that becomes an early sign. Uh, we have, of course, been able to uh, curb the bunking of Sanjay now that the parents know. I think before we could, parents fixed bunking in their own way. Um, but more importantly, uh, because Sanjay has now five six hours of schooling, and now more focused support, uh, and and a, and a better uh, outreach mechanism both by the teacher and the family, perhaps Sanjay is on the path to recovery. I will continue to tell stories and I will continue to link. Uh, this time Alicia. Alicia is a 9 year old, 11 days consecutive absence, so we thought what is excluding her. And we realized when we reached out to the family that the father has murdered the mother and now is in jail. Net net, Alicia from having two parents a uh, few days ago to having one dead and practically not the other not being available. Uh, and imagine the kind of trauma that Alicia now experiences. And certainly attending the school to learn perhaps about uh, uh, algebra is uh, of little relevance. We supported, uh, uh, the good thing in this case of relatives wanting to take care of Alicia. So there is a Delhi government scheme under which, and she also has siblings, uh, children of, of in such situation you are eligible to get 6,500 rupees a month so that other relatives can take care of you and you don't have to end up in a children's home. Because we acknowledge and realize that family is the best space for a child to grow up in. We got that 6,500 rupees to this family. Uh, we, we got a counsellor to start talking. Uh, to uh, Alicia, and I remember the conversation with the teacher. So we asked the teacher, uh, and the teacher asked us, what do you want us to do, what can we do? And, and I remember a long conversation and I, and I asked uh, the teacher as to if, if such a tragedy were to happen uh, in your family, what would you expect your teacher or friends to do? And she responded at least to give a phone call. And uh, before I could say anything, her immediate response was, yeah, I have the number, I'll make a phone call. And that became an example of what excludes and what can include. Sometimes a phone call is a great start. Not enough, but a very good start. And the conversation went on uh, and I followed up a month later with the class teacher uh, and I asked uh, the class teacher, so how is Alicia doing? Uh, the greatest thing was the teacher had become so observant and that's empathy at scale of Alicia's uh, uh, well-being at school that she started paying extra attention. She started paying whether Alicia is eating lunch alone. Does she have a peer who can uh, you know, constantly nudge her? In the sports period, is she playing or she just sitting in the class? Sometimes it's little nudges. Uh, can go along, but it all starts with two important stages. One, a system at a systemic level being alert to something possibly going amiss. And attendance in that sense is one of the best predictor. And it's all the more relevant when Asar every year tells us that there are about 97% of our children are enrolled in, in school system of one kind or the other. And that for 97%, attendance is a remarkable predictor. That means for us to be alert that attendance is the earliest warning to the system that something is wrong. We don't yet know what is. That requires outreach. That requires listening to the story. That requires, once we hear the story, 
to act on it. But all of that is contingent on us first remaining alert to the earliest warning in the system. And in Delhi government, because we have been alert to this earliest warning possible, in just about, and I'll come to Ravi's story in a little while, uh, we've identified about 3 lakh children who uh, are chronically absent. We, we call them at-risk students. For whatever reason, we don't get fully know the risk, but we know there is some form of risk because we comprehensively reject the submission and I'm so glad that many of the speakers uh, uh, also said that explicitly and called out that uh, uh, the argument that oh, these parents don't want to teach their children simply doesn't cut the ice. I have in my life never met a parent who don't uh, want uh, the kind of future for the children that they can only dream of. I don't know where these parents are. Every single parent wants, wants but it's better than the best that they can imagine for the children. And they will go to any length to get that, their children that future. Perhaps only question is, do they see value in what we are offering them? And that needs to improve. So three lakh students at risk. So far, we, we have had to intervene in the kind of the four or five stories that I told. We have had to, that qualifies as a high intensive intervention. So we've had to intervene at such high intensive, intensity about 3,100 times. But in most cases, low intensity and middle intensity also work. Sometimes the nudge is very small. In one of the instances, uh, one of the children stopped coming to school uh, uh, simply because <coughs> that particular child, uh, uh, and I remember our, call, our help and operator called uh, the family, and uh, as soon as the help and operator called the family, uh, the father started shouting. He aap log battamiz ho aap log kuch jaise tak aage hum Delhi sarkar se bol rahe battamiz ho aap log gadhe bhar rakhe hain aap logon ne and after the father was done thankfully the our help and operator was extremely uh, patient and finally when he was done he asked uh, you are right uh, but tell us why <laughs> um, and the father then said uh, my daughter studies in all boys section and the next section has girls as well as boys I have told this class teacher so many times and you people just don't listen to me. You give me all kinds of things, academic, whatever, whatever. I will not send my daughter to such a school. And she was about 15 years old. And such a simple fix of problem. We called the principal 24 hours. That's it. But there's a systemic problem. We solved it for this girl, but we sat down with the, the teachers and the principal as to why would we have COVID in the first instance. And that long conversation, whatever, uh, we solved it for many. Sometimes the point is the intensity or the intervention required is very low touch, but can go a long way. So, so far in about 12 months of existence of this early warning uh, uh, kind of approach, we have brought about 48,341 children back to school in about 11 and a half months of its existence by hearing this, first by being empathetic enough at scale to be alert uh, to uh, to their uh, possibility of vulnerability reflected in the in the consecutive absence, uh, and then uh, reaching out to them to hear the stories, reaching out to them in the form of an SMS, IVR, WhatsApp, uh, helpline-driven uh, manual calls. When none of it works, a home visit. And so far, uh, seventy thousand other children we have been in touch with, but haven't been able to bring about whatever gap you see. Forty thousand plus seventy thousand. That's roughly uh, one point three lakh. So the gap that you see, 1.7 lakh, is a struggle that we deal with uh, and so far don't necessarily have a solution for. But uh, hopefully we'll, a month later, uh, uh, I will, uh, a year or two later, perhaps in another conference I'll come and these numbers will be much better. But let me go back to the last story and then come back to the, 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 the theme of uh, the inclusion specific on a smaller segment of, of disability. And this particular child, 13 year old, uh, was absent for 19 days. So once again, uh, we reached out. And the reason was uh, the child was visually impaired. Now that we did figure later. Uh, what we heard from the family was, uh, uh, school mein teacher or baki bache, bada gadha, uh, you know, dumb, ye to hai, theek se copy bhi kar sakta board se, kind of words is fairly common. And of course the child was bullied. Uh, I, I mean, the child was bullied and the child suddenly didn't want to attend the school 
I'll understand that you say, you know, I wouldn't want to go to the place which calls me consistently dumb, gada, uh, incompetent, or whatever. It's very understandable, legitimately. Uh, the child also doesn't want to school, come to school. Uh, and parents have tried everything, but uh, the child is just hell-bent on not coming to school uh, for understandable reasons. And we uh, managed to, uh, f f just for an opportunity, like, just if you can come to the school for a week, uh, and we, we, we talked to the teacher, uh, the students, and the principal there, and we realized that the child actually has visual impairment, which is why the child can't copy ni kasakta words it is which is why the Shameen's point in the morning that when you say go to chapter 4 some 6 just give a 5 seconds pause in between it allows children to catch up sometimes this including children uh, with special needs is all about uh, not including them just, just simply being a better teacher in just good teaching pedagogical practices which works for all students not just child with special uh, or child with disability uh, and this brings me to my last segment once again what systemically uh, might uh, be the approach and let me start with the uh, uh, the wonderful study that should be presented in the morning uh, uh, and I must compliment uh, LFE, Madhuka, Shruti and the Andhra team Sudhesh for uh, in coming out with the study. But I will slightly deviate from the study and, and go one step further. Uh, and go back to the old age, you know, uh, infrastructure hona chai disability ke liye yahan bhi rank mein hai. It is in the name of Deputy Prime Minister of India. I don't think, uh, this is third senior most position in the country. Yahan bhi rank mein hai. Udhar bhi rank mein hai. Idhar bhi rank mein hai. So let's just, uh, uh, now move on. If if an auditorium built in the name of Deputy Prime Minister of India can't have a RAM, it's almost, and I'm going to sound pessimistic, but I'll come to the solution of a different kind. Uh, then this is not something worth chasing. And if RAM is made, then what is it? Let's make it. Suppose here RAM is made. Then what Because there are way more barriers just two minutes ago. Way more barriers before one accesses the ramp here, preceding the, which brings me, and the point Professor um, was making at the panel earlier um, about assistive technologies. We have to stop thinking of this sympathy, empathy, and all of these are important, uh, but we have I mean, done dusted. Uh, it's not. If if you are empathetic to me, that doesn't make my life dignified to help with your empathy and sympathy. Uh, it doesn't restore my everyday ability to function. It's, it doesn't restore my abil everyday ability to perform executive functions of eating on my own, of going to a restaurant, of enjoying a movie, of hanging out with friends, whatever. So then how do we involve assistive technology in making the life dignified? And there are a lot of, and last month we had the benefit of organizing a conference uh, and we have to start thinking in terms of technology. You see the captions, now they're switched off. <coughs> Uh, oh, there, yes. Do you see the captions there? That's making something accessible, and technology has made that possible. And in the last one conference that we organized, we saw many, many products, and the question is for governments uh, that how do we make them accessible for all children? As simple as I was share, sharing earlier with Madhukar, if I can't hear, now there is a product, not yet in the market, it's in prototype stage, but some stage it will be, wherein there is a the live transcribing will happen on your specs as you speak. And so you will not even realize that I can't, can't hear. Because you will say something, I'll read it on my specs kind of things, and respond to you in real time. Or the rod, the, the cane that Professor Sago was using in the morning, which actually generates signals to you as you move closer to the obstruction. That allows you to walk on your own. And nobody needs to hold your hand. So those are the questions that we need to ask uh, ultimately. So how do we restore the dignity of, of, of uh, everyone? And that doesn't necessarily look in the term in terms of me performing someone else's function or somebody else performing my functions. It is about everybody capable of making or performing their own functions. And at some level, they are. 
only accommodations that Professor Sa was uh, uh, alluding to earlier, only certain accommodations are required, and Braille is not an accommodation. That is a reading aloud device, for example, uh, that allows me to access the digital world. And those are the questions that we need to reflect on. Lastly, and I'm very cognizant of this fact, uh, you know, there's a, a sitcom called Yes Minister. It's my favorite. It used, used to be saved on my laptop in the educational folder, although it's a situation comedy. But it's an educational situation comedy. And there's a beautiful conversation between the minister, uh, minister and the uh, principal secretary. And the minister is frustrated with the bureaucracy. And he screams at the top of his voice. And he says, government is an organized crime against humanity. To which the principal secretary immediately objects. And the principal secretary says, government cannot be organized. <laughs> and that's the monster we need to unpack. Thank you. Yeah.